When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. When he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said this, he died. And Saul approved their killing him. That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. But Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This morning we are continuing to look at the life of the early church and the radical changes that took place in this group of men and women that took place after Jesus was resurrected and ascended into heaven. Now, there are a lot of different approaches to trying something new or being thrust into a new setting as the disciples were. We don't have necessarily the same settings, but we do know what it is to be new, whether it's going to a new school or starting a new job, you know, maybe going to prison. All these things are new, and all of them come with their own types of rules that people set up for themselves as they enter into that new setting. One of the tried and true rules of starting something new is to keep your head down, do your work, don't make waves. You don't want to draw too much attention to yourself. Don't do too much. Don't do too little. Be friendly, but not too friendly. Be average. Or as my roommate in college said, C's get degrees. You'll figure that out later. I know some pastors in the United Methodist Church who approach ministry this way. They get to a new church. Uh, they love the church. They love the community. They love the people. They want to do excellent work for Jesus, but they also don't want to be moved. Uh, in a denomination where we are appointed year to year at the bishop's pleasure, there is a desire among some clergy to just keep your head down and don't be too excellent, don't screw up, it's kind of the Goldilocks method of ministry. Not too big, not too small. Stay between the lines. And it leads to a ministry of mediocrity. As we look at Stephen's story this morning, I want to nominate Stephen as the example why some pastors approach ministry as mediocrity. Stephen is a warning to those who strive for excellence. If he had only stayed in his lane, if he could have just done his job as it was assigned to him, none of the stuff we read about this morning would have happened. Do you know what Stephen's job was in the book of Acts? It happens a little earlier in chapter 7. His job was almsgiver. Almsgiver. He was asked to take money and or food and distribute it to the widows because the 12 disciples of Jesus were too busy to do it. In fact, the twelve said, we're too busy sharing the word of God to wait on tables. A little hoity, if you ask me. La-di-da, fancy twelve disciples. So they pick seven fellas in good standing, and they say, we are delegating some tasks out to you lower-level fellas. You guys are the new widow waiters. They call them almsgivers, but I like widow waiters better. Now, on the surface, that sounds like an easy job, right? You take some food, you serve the food, you take care of the people in need. Maybe if you're a real go-getter, you, you pray with them, say some nice words, offer some hospitality. That's it. That's all you have to do. That's all that Stephen was asked to do. But Stephen was too good at his job. He's a self-starter. He's an eager beaver, overachiever. He took on aspects of the job that no one asked him to do. In fact, Scripture says that he wasn't just giving alms to the widows. He was doing signs and wonders. 
And apparently the 12 were too busy to supervise their new employee. No one told him, hey, Stephen, this isn't in your job description. The other six guys don't say, Steve, you're making us all look bad. Just serve the food. Cut out the signs and wonders. You're drawing too much attention to us. People are talking. The elders and the scribes of the synagogue are looking at what you're doing. Knock it off, man. But he doesn't end with that. And the elders and the scribes in the synagogue get stirred up. And they, in turn, stir up the people and get people to bring false charges against Stephen of blasphemy. They say he's saying that Jesus is going to come and he's going to destroy the temple. And that their customs and traditions that they have become accustomed to are going to get upended. Everything's going to change. Change is coming, and we don't want change. Note how different the reaction is to this truth-telling from last week to this week. If you were here with us last week, we talked about Pentecost and Peter preaching the first sermon on the other side of Jesus' ascension, the other side of the Holy Spirit coming and how the people embrace and accept this truth in a way that they never had before. 3,000 people come to the faith. This week, when change is presented to the people in power, the powerful attempt to suppress the change. But Stephen doesn't shrink from this charge. Instead, he offers the accusers a full theological discourse on the law, Moses, the prophets, And he concludes this challenge with the fact that they're not willing to listen to the Spirit of God. As change occurs in their midst, they are unwilling to listen to the Holy Spirit. Basically he says, I haven't kept the law. You haven't kept the law. He pulls a full Pacino and says, I'm out of order. This whole court's out of order. And he drops the theological mic. Now, the elders in the synagogue, elders, that's what they're called, react like children. They physically cover their ears. La, 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 I can't hear you. And they rush him and prepare to stone him to death. And Stephen, ever the faithful servant, takes a posture very similar to Jesus Christ as he goes to his death as the first martyr of the Christian church. And this alone would have been a tragic end to a young, faithful man's life. But this death sets off a chain reaction. You see, there's this young Pharisee there in the crowd named Saul. He's the one that approved of Stephen's death sentence. And the persecution of the church begins as Saul ravages the church, dragging people off to prison, traveling far and wide to bring an end to this blasphemous offshoot of the true faith. And this scatters the apostles and the disciples even further in this post-resurrection diaspora. On the other side of Stephen's martyrdom, we find that things get worse, not better. Now, in our hearts, I think we know this isn't the way that these stories are supposed to go, right? We know that all things are supposed to steadily improve forever and always. Every day can be better than the last, right? But the story of the early church and the resurrection is not a fairy tale. There is no happily ever after, after Easter. This is real life. And in the early church, we find that when people speak truth, Sometimes things get worse before they get better. When we are brave, and some might say foolish enough, to speak our truth to the powerful, there will be resistance. Because speaking truth to power is revolutionary. We see this in past history. We see this in current events. Everything from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement to the end of apartheid to Reformation to the early days of the Methodist Movement, each one of these historical events has been met with strong physical resistance. And today we see protests by groups attempting to speak their truth, whether it's Black Lives Matter or Me Too or Never Again or teacher walkouts in Oklahoma and Kentucky. 
these historical events and these current events show us that there is always an equal and opposite reaction when someone speaks their truth. In Stephen's case, it escalated to violence, murder, death. In others, it doesn't always escalate that way. But there is always a cost. There is always a cost, whether it be financial, relational, emotional, the question for us, I think, as we look at Stephen's story and think about our own is, is my truth worth the cost? For Stephen, his truth was he could not stand for those in power to say that he was guilty of blasphemy. His faith was at the very core of his identity. And he had to speak his truth, no matter the cost. I think that's often the part that we don't think about when we encounter people that we disagree with. That they're speaking their truth in the face of resistance. Most people who take the brave step of facing resistance and accepting that high cost, whatever it may be, are doing so because they are staying central to who they are. For most, it comes down to identity or at the very least, protecting those who they feel are being treated unjustly. But we often dismiss their words without thinking about who they are. Because we live in a modern world where we can post anything, any thought we have that comes into our pretty little heads on anything in public forums with no repercussion. There's minimal danger involved in stating your beliefs on Facebook or Instagram, and more and more often we find that what we say doesn't even need to be true. There's no accountability. There's no risk. As long as your mom or your boss doesn't see it, you can say pretty much whatever you want. I think it's left us in a place where we don't even know what true is anymore. We refuse to acknowledge someone's truth that it may be different from our own. Or worse, we lose our filter and say every true thing that we know, regardless of whether we should or not. We're all coulda, no shoulda. I love the story of our nephew Stuart when he was a little boy. He went shopping with his mom, Danielle. They were at a large mall, and a woman commented on what a cute little boy Stuart was. And Stuart turned and looked at her and said, Mama, that lady looks like a witch. Danielle shocked and stuttered and stammered, Oh, I'm so sorry. It's, it's because you're wearing a long black skirt. Stuart piped up, it's not because of her skirt, it's because of her teeth. We teach our children over time and through multiple embarrassing encounters to manage the truth that they tell. In other words, we want them to tell the truth, but you don't have to say every true thing you know. Perhaps we should learn to value and accept that other people sometimes live and understand a different truth from ourselves. And that their truth is just as vital and important to them as ours is. And maybe we don't have to bring the full brunt of our punishment and resistance against them every single time. I think the response of the elders in the story is a lesson for us. Their response is rage rather than listen. Their emotional response does not allow them to hear what their brother is saying. They instead choose to cover their ears to guard against what someone else sees as vital. They are more concerned with the preservation of their truth than they really are for hearing what another has to say. Because here's the thing, they don't have to. They don't have to. They're, they're more powerful. They have the numbers on their side. They have thousands of years of tradition to lean upon. I see this repetition of history throughout the church because we have to admit that while we were once a minority, we are now a vast majority. We hold power and sway. We hold tradition in our hands. But if we are honestly going to approach people we disagree with, there comes a point where we have to lay some of that down. Or at the very least, uncover our ears to hear one another. 
We have to work through these disagreements that we have as a church, as a denomination, as a community, as brothers and sisters in Christ, with maturity and love and respect for one another. We can't just shut our ears and throw rocks. And we have to realize that, yes, it may get worse before it gets better. But that is the call.